Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome. I'm Karen Passion, and I'm the fundraiser at the Cart Horse Protection Association, and you are watching the second episode of Coffee with Cart Horse, and there are many more to come. We really hope that you enjoyed the Lesotho Equine Welfare Project that we hosted two weeks ago. As you know, due to COVID, we have had to <clears throat> think of more innovative ways to raise funds, and that is how Coffee with Cart Horse was inspired. We will be hosting several episodes going forward, talking everything about equines. And so look, so look out for more information on our social media platforms and diarize the date and please join us. So grab a beverage, sit back, relax and enjoy the next 14 minutes with us. But before we get started, I just want to mention a few um, housekeeping issues. Um, because we are on a webinar, everybody's camera has been switched off and you have been muted. Um, but there is a, um, a chat um, function um, at, at the bottom of your, of your webinar. There's, a, there's an icon. So please put your questions in the, 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 the chat icon and we will address your questions at the, at the end of the webinar. If you are um, joining us tonight with your phone, there are three little dots at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and the chat icon will also come up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and at the end, um, while we will be having questions and you would prefer to actually speak to um, our guest this evening, um, put up your hand and we will unmute you and our technician will um, allow you to speak. So those are the housekeeping rules. Um, without further ado, let's meet our guest for this evening's Coffee with Castles. Tonight we will be speaking to Philippa, um, Philippa de Toy, um, who started her NPO Blind Love nine years ago. Philippa was born in Cape Town and moved to the Free State when she was seven years old to a wonderful farm with many, many ponies. There, Philippa met her husband, Vanner, when she had two ponies, one sheep and 10 cats. Philippa and her husband are actually potters, artists and ceramic designers by trade. Not only is Philippa a wife, um, a loving mother to a true two children which she homeschools. She's also an entrepreneur but she also looks after many horses in the Debunchu area funding the project 95% all by herself. This is one remarkable story how one woman has changed the welfare of these working horses who have never seen a vet or a farrier and it still to this day keeps her up at night how she's going to do it all the next day. Thank you so much, Karen. Oh, no, that's okay. We're gonna. Yeah. <laughs>
sorry. Welcome, Philippa. We are absolutely thrilled to have you with us this evening. Hi, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can you... It's all, all good. <clears throat> thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. And thank you to the Cartwheels Protection Unit for this amazing opportunity. Um, so, how did it all begin? Yes. Can that... you tell us about the the two horses, special horses that started Blind Love? Alrighty. Um, so, um, in 2005, I took in my first rescue. Um, and she was a, a thoroughbred mare that had been abandoned um, on a farm in the Free State. And her name was Victoria. Um, Victoria um, came to us, we loaded her up and brought her home and when she arrived she spent the first three weeks lying like a dead horse um, and at that time I had my two little daughters, Ella, there, there she is, um, uh, you can't see in the photo there but Ella was a newborn baby at the time and little Kath was two years old and we used to strap Ella into the car seat and drive down the road and Kathy would jump out and say, mom, is she alive? Is she alive? Aww. And Vic would lift her head and um, somehow we pulled her through and she went from strength to strength and very, very quickly, within a couple of months, she became, wow, there she is. Wow. Yeah. Big and fat. <laughs> Uh, she was big and fat and a typical chestnut thoroughbred mare. Um, and then after that, obviously, a couple of more rescues down the line, friends for Vic, and I took in another little horse. Um, she was a little filly of about 18 months old at the time. Is this blush? She, yes. That is my blush. Um, you can see the condition she was in, absolutely emaciated, tiny, skinny. Um, but what we noticed is at the time that she had these beautiful dark eyes that looked like they'd been smudged with, with like a, like a eye shadow. So yeah, makeup. the kids and I were, what are we going to name her? And we went through all the Maybellines, mascara and she was also a very shy little horse, so we decided to call her Blush. Um, she grew up into a beautiful, strong, robust horse. Mm -hmm. But when she was about four, she started going blind. We, we didn't realize it at the time. Um, the vet came and we treated it like, like a normal infection. And we had eye drops and um, they cleared up. And then about a month later, she would get, a, get another flare up. And then in her other eye, and it, 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 eye it's eye. sort of, yeah, and it, it would come back almost every month, it felt like. And I eventually became like a woman possessed, and I was on Dr. Google, and I came up mm -hmm. with this thing that <laughs> they called moon blindness back in the olden days because it, it, it would seem to recur and return when the moon was full. And I started dreading the full moon um, mm -hmm. because it, it, it really felt like whenever the moon was full, blush would have a flare up. Mm -hmm. um, it is actually equine recurrent uveitis. Um, and each time she would have a flare up, she, she would lose more vision in whatever eye was being affected. Sometimes it was both eyes. Um, Nobody to this day they don't really know what is called, you know, what what causes it. Is it bacterial, parasitic, or ocular trauma? Um, but after that initial flare up, um, it it sets off like an autoimmune response, and we obviously realised this too late with Blush. Um, so she was fairly blind already. Um, and it was an absolute nightmare. I mean, it was a roller coaster. We had to remove her out of the herd. Everyone was telling me to, to, to put her down and why am I keeping her alive? But I mean, other than she's her learned, vision. She's learned, she's learned to cope through the years 
to cope with her blindness and she's perfectly fine. Exactly. And today when she went, when she finally went hundred percent blind, it was an absolute, um, almost like a blessing because as you say, Karen, she could just, she negotiates around the field, she gets mm -hmm. through the gates um, and she actually avoids um, obstacles. There she was actually, that was one of the last couple of terms where she could, act. that was a terrible day actually, she, on the, on the slide there. Um, she Why literally we... went blind while she was running around in the field I, and I could see it happening. They were all charging around and I could suddenly see her just kind of, Used. whoa. And um, yeah, brilliant. But it's actually an, an amazing story because um, <clears throat> Blush and Victoria were, were companions. You, like I said, your, your first two precious horses that started this amazing um, NPO that you have um, called Blind Love. Um, yeah. Philippa, I know that you also do outreach clinics every two weeks. Um, would you tell us what that entails? And also, I believe on one of these clinics, you came across the legend Shine. Right. So, um, as you mentioned earlier, I grew up in, in, in the Free State and Tabanchu was, it's, uh, quite close to our family farm. We used to actually have to drive through to Bantu to Bloom to buy our monthly groceries. Yes. So even as a child, I was very aware of the cart horse community what and I used to try on? and save my money. And I was determined I was gonna save them all. Um, so obviously when I registered my MPO, um, I decided I really had to do something in that community. Uh, so Tabiso and I, got in the car and off we went um, and we started chatting to the owners, assessing the horses, asking them what they needed. Um, and it became very clear right from the beginning that the thing they, they just had access to absolutely nothing um, in terms of tack, feed, veterinary care. They, they just had absolutely nothing at their disposal. So what we we first we started with was um, a, a food a food you know um, and uh, we would I would it became it would became a full-time job I would drive around source food buy bales and we'd have to mill the bales mix it ourselves by hand so it was to be saw myself and my poor housekeeper Susan and we would mix the food and put it in bags. And every two weeks, we would take the food through um, to Tabanshu. And Karen, I promise you, it was never, it, it's still, to, it's never enough. It's never you enough. Know, the, the numbers of owners, we started off with about 15 and very soon there were 50 owners and we're now working with over 80 horse owners. Um, but you also said that these horse owners, they've got, you know, they don't just have one horse. And at one time you were dealing with 600 horses to feed and doing as much as you can this is to get this food to go further mm. and further. Richard, um, we have been lucky enough that now uh, we've been able to actually find a, a, a company in Tabanchu and he molds and he, he has, uh, he's prepared to do a mix for us for 60 Rand a bag. So that means the guys aren't dependent on us going every two weeks. They can go any day of the week, Saturday mornings, and buy food at a subsidized rate that we still subsidize for them. The other thing was the veterinary care. Um, uh, there was a state clinic there, and it was in a shambles. And then when mm -hmm. the government rolled out the community service vets, we were able to make use of those young vets. Um, and it made a huge difference. For the first time, the horses were being vet checked, um, dewormed, minor injuries were being treated. And what's also happened there is, um, there is Shine. Yes. <laughs> but what I was going to say is the owners have been, um, the, the vet used to come down every two weeks with us and see all the horses. But now, as over, the, over time, they actually go up and they make use of the clinic themselves, which means they can go any day of the week as well. Absolutely. Um, you, and you still monitor these horses in between vet visits, which is 
they don't just get seen to every two weeks. You you would still yeah. go in and make yeah. sure that the horses, the ones that needed attention, would 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 have attention or got what they need. Shine Shine was one of the, the first that I met, and I actually had to walk away the day I met him with tears in my eyes because I knew he was not going to last. I mean, he you can see in the, the one photo he had broken knees, skin and bone, no teeth. Um, but that that's Shine as well, terrible saddle sore. But his owner, and this is also what I, I, I think I need to say, is the owner really, really cared. And I, and I mean, to this so. day, since he still asks me, how is Shine doing? Um, and he called me um, eventually sort of 18 months later and said, Shine is ready to retire. And would you take him? And, and I, uh, I, we had to negotiate because that's also, uh, we are not like the SPCA, we can't just go in and confiscate no, or no, remove. We don't have the power. So there's always got something um, that, uh, so we had to bargain and actually pay for Shine and make the owner sign that he now belonged to us. Um, and the owner had said to me, if you don't give me what I want, we will just slaughter him. My um, goodness. And a, a lot of people find that quite shocking, but the thing is, I think it also highlights the, their own poverty. Absolutely. Um, you it's, know, and... Yeah. But Shine um, also... Um, <clears throat> He's, he's become your resident Lipizzaner, and the reason why we call him the legend Shine is because he basically taught all the other horses in the area how to pull a cart. And that's why he's a legend, obviously for you, because you 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 love and adore and you've taken him into, his, into your home, but he's a legend with everybody in Tabanshu because of the impact that he made. Um, although, you know, not cared for, he was, yeah, still to this day he is he is a legend and um and and rightfully so um in your work you have met a lot of horses and taken many horses into your sanctuary um and the next story is about um gorgeous valentine can you please tell us more about her story okay little val um uh i got a frantic call from someone one day um, they had seen this horse and they actually couldn't even figure out what they had been looking at. Yes. And they said, please go and look. So of course, Tabiso and I, off we raced again and we found her, um, an absolute feral little horse belonging to no one, um, grazing out behind the townships uh, with the no stallion. Way. Yeah. And so I've, we, we took photos of her and I sent them to my vet and her initial response was no joy, no happiness. I think she must be put down, but she actually emailed me that later that evening and said, you know what? She looks healthy. Her, her, the rest of her body is in, in good condition. Wow. She socialized and give it a chance. So little Val though, absolutely eluded us. I mean, her name is Valentine. So this was um, January and I had aimed to pick her up and bring her home by February. That didn't happen. February, March, April, this little cripple filly would disappear for weeks and nobody, eventually I had everyone in the townships. I had everyone everywhere looking for her. On the, on the park of Val. And then you won't believe it, Suddenly, one day we got a call that Val was wherever, and off we drove. And the stallion had had left her behind, which was also a blessing because in my head I'd had sleepless nights about how on earth are we going to separate them, separate leave the him behind. Yeah, um, and here she was, all on her own. So what we did was we quickly put a little makeshift fence up around her gave her some hay and water and for the next couple of days we went back twice a day a couple of times a day I was there <laughs> felt like all the time and on the third day when she actually saw my car driving up she neighed and I said to Tobiso we've got her no um, she's coming to save her 
<laughs> and we loaded her up, I think, a day or two later. Wonderful. No, I know she, she actually followed me onto the trailer with the food. And she came home and my, fa my farrier worked absolute wonders. Um, he actually side, on the next slide, we'll see that. There we go. The amazing, yeah. amazing job that he did. The, next is, um, the vet actually said that her leg had been fractured in two places and she had obviously walked on it at the time. Yeah. One long time. Trying. Yeah, and that's why. Um, but anyway, Val was an absolute blessing, angel, happiest, little, playful. Um, of course, I think many people fell in love with her. Um, yeah. And thank, thank, you, thank you that you were there to, to save her. Um, in um, here, here with the cart horse, um, we often have a lot of owners signing their horses over to us. Um, mm -hmm. And thank goodness you, you have the same relationship um, with the, the cart horse owners in your area. Um, everybody, now we're gonna show you a video um, of, of Pilot. Um, which is one of those horses that was signed over to to Philippa, and we're going to see the the before video. Come, come on, girl. Oh my goodness, Philippa, um, this, that video, I think is still one of the most shocking videos um, that I've seen. And this is a, a video of a, um, of a horse that was signed over to you, but you actually didn't have any clue on the state that Pilot was in. Can you tell us more about her, her rescue? Yeah. Um, pilot, it, it was actually, I got a call uh, just before lockdown last year, uh, a lady called Christine, and she had actually been looking for a horse since 2013. I think she actually even wrote you guys an email way back then, and your reply had been, uh, the, uh, you advised her to try and look for a horse closer That's to, close to, to her. Look and obviously she, she'd only heard about us quite recently. Yeah. And so I kept, I said to her, well, I don't have anything at the moment, uh, but I will let you know as soon as something comes along. And then towards the end of July, so still in lockdown, one of the mm -hmm. owners called me and he was very concerned. Once again, very concerned. He absolutely adored Pilot. Um, and he was concerned that she was going to die if she stayed with him. Yes. And uh, would I please find her a home? So immediately I called Christine. I said, I found your horse. Your horse. And, <clears throat> yep, we made plans um, for me to go and fetch Pilot, and she was going to go straight to Christine. So off we went again with the horse box. And when I got to Tabanchu and I called him and I said, Where are you? Cause, and he said, She's not getting up. And then I thought, oh goodness. So off we went and Pilot was down. We managed to get her up and she, I could already see her, her, her hair was starting to fall out in clumps all again. over her body. And he said to me, and you could see she was covered in ticks, every inch of her body. And he'd poured deadline literally from Beautiful. top to bottom. That basically burnt her skin and her body. That's why it looks like it does. Um, Anyway, we, we managed to get her up that day, uh, but she was too weak, obviously, to transport. So I took her food. This was a Friday afternoon, and 
it haunted me. I mean, it was it was just like too much because I did not want her to die there. So by the Monday, I said, you know what, whatever happens, we are going to fetch her. So we went through and we got her into the box standing because once she was up, she seemed to be stronger mm -hmm. and we got her home. Um, but then I must say, Karen, for the, the next three weeks, it was, I, I literally poured my entire life into this horse because she could not get up on her own. She was too big. It, it took three, four people, as you said, to actually get her up, to stand up. Um, it um, was, but she never gave up. She, she actually never gave up once. Um, and suddenly one morning, Michael, we thought, oh, wow, she, she hadn't laid down. But then my groom, Michael, said to me, no, look at this. She has been lying down because she had hay in her mane and hay on the side of her blanket. And then we realized, actually, suddenly, Pilot is lying down and she's able to get up. And yeah. after that, she uh, went from strength to strength. Uh, and uh, we took oh. her. Yeah, there she is. I mean, she was so thin that I had to. There you can see a normal blanket underneath her. It just, like, was... She was so narrow, so we ended up having bone. to take a tiny, tiny pony blanket <laughs> and put it over. Um, and then eventually she off. found her, and then eventually she and found her forever home with Christine that wanted a pony. And um, now we basically, sorry, now we're going to, to watch a video of the remarkable transformation of Pilot. What an incredible transformation. My goodness. <laughs> I have to say, all your horses look so fat and and healthy after you've, you've rescued and taken care of them. But, but Philippa, despite level five lockdown, almost practically in the beginning, it took a whole community to find Vuma, um, your, your next incredible um, rescue. Can you, can you tell us about this? This um, guy. What happened with Vuma was at the beginning of March last year, I got a call from a good friend and her daughter, and they had seen Vuma in the township. Um, and they had also uh, thought he needed to be put down right then and there. Uh, and they, uh, then it, they, they, he disappeared, and she gave me a ring and she said, Please, you need to find this horse. Uh, and obviously, obviously I the area. Sorry, obviously the area that you that you're working in is just so vast and and big. I mean, people, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure, you'd find it quite strange that you can't find a horse. But these horses are out in the field, in and in the wild. Um, and so what happened was, I put word out amongst the horse owners, and Tabisa and I kept our ears to the ground. And then suddenly on. The Sunday before lockdown started, I think it's the 22nd of March, yes. Sunday afternoon, I got a phone call from a policewoman who had obviously been in, in Manya Singh and she called and she said, I've seen this horse. He is down. He cannot get up. And if I had had my gun with me, I would have, he needs to be put down. No, so we went out with the vet and the vet um, couldn't find anything. Oh, sorry. Here's my cat. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> the, vet, the vet couldn't find anything wrong. You know, nothing was broken. Yes. Uh, so no reason to go share with the owner. Yep. Oh, what a handsome little boy. We started negotiating with the owner. So bearing in mind, this was the Monday before lockdown. 
and the owners just they were they were they weren't prepared to let him go. No, um, they weren't. So we left it and let them mull it over, and then suddenly on the Thursday afternoon when lockdown was due to start at nine that night, I got a call saying, you can come and fetch him. So I phoned the policewoman and I said, what are the implications if I go tomorrow? Because we're, you know, I've got things to do. And anyway, we decided to go and fetch him then and there, brought him home. <clears throat> and he, he was a stallion at the time. So he, it was also like, where does he go? Because I've got nine mares. So we had to put in with my two old pet sheep and he was very happy. He spent his days lying, lying down a lot, he, um, but he is fully recovered. We gelded him in July and he is now friends with Blush. There he is. Everybody seems to be friends with, with Blush. I mean, she's just <laughs> such an amazing, amazing girl. I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually, you, can't wait wait to meet her one day but um philippa also we all know about the the amazing healing power of horses um how has your program heard by a horse um given your horses a new purpose uh Karen, this was a program we ran for a couple of years obviously with lockdown not not much happened uh but what it was was we had the children from our local orphanage mm -hmm. or children's home would, would come out and on, on a Saturday and spend the day, spend the morning with the horses, grooming them, doing little obstacles and just getting out, building their self-confidence, being in nature. Um, and then they would Did have lunch. Them experience the worst, worst kind of um, issues and, yeah. and, and violence yeah. in their lives and and suffer major, major trauma because of that. Yeah, and, and, and the lady that runs the children's home uh, said they had they, they never got to go out. You know, weekends come and they would just lie around and do have nothing. nothing to do. So they really enjoyed it. And they even went uh, riding with my car. My other friend, Karen, has a riding school. Uh, so Karen's ponies were very suitable. And the kids absolutely loved it. Uh, and they would have lunch. Sometimes they'd even come and spend the afternoon in our studio and make things with the clay. And, you know, so it was, it was really yeah, You were very creative with them at your, at your mud studio and um, taught them amazing um, skills. Yeah. And there's, uh, well, it's just, um, and if we can see the next um, slide, um, Julia, and I just want to just show everybody um what these horses i mean that 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 photograph just speaks yeah. speaks um yeah, yeah to me what these what these horses can actually do for these children and and show and, them empathy and, the horse, and yeah. yeah um and then also you you have a this has also helped your humane um education efforts in in the community which is basically linked yeah, uh, our humane, uh, we make use of uh, educational material from the Humane Education Trust. And it's, it's readers and puzzles and board games. And what we do is um, the, the, the local uh, disadvantaged schools in the area make use of the, this material. Um, and I was an art teacher in a couple of the schools, so I always kind of, in my art lessons, would also bring in, you know, mm -hmm. empathy, caring about others, you know, uh, all life matters, you know, and two of our big events uh, in our humane education program were our, our World Rabies Day, um, uh, where we would have a dog show, and the vet would come and he would give a talk about rabies and the dogs would be vaccinated for free. And we also made use of a little booklet from the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, Want a Friend, Be a Friend, which the kids also, it's got puzzles in it and also just looking after your pet. They need food and water, the five freedoms for animals. And exactly. And, and, and for those that don't know, um, 
Philippa looks after the equine horses in the Tabanchu area, but she's also very involved with, with um, all animals in need in the area, dogs, cats, sheep, cattle, and, 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 and does ama amazing work with teaching, like she said, the, um, the, the, the children in the area that, 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 that all life matters. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to get onto a very controversial subject next, um, which is traditional bush racing, um, which is, which is very rife in, in your area. And we would just like to know how, how would you like to change people's perceptions, um, about this, um, this tradition that, that, that happens in a lot of, in a lot of areas in, in South Africa. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I think the term bush racing conjures up all these negative. It does, um, it does. Like cruelty and theft and it, it, it's not the case. I mean, here yeah, you mm -hmm. can see with this picture, the, the horses are really, really cared for. So it, it's something that's been around in South Africa for, for more than a century. You know, the, uh, the causes used to race on, on cattle. It's been around since more than a hundred years. And, and what it is, is it's more, um, the villagers will all get together and the horses will come from all around and it becomes like a community recreational fun day for the whole community. And there, there is, no, no betting no. or gambling. What, what happens is they pay an entrance fee and that entrance fee goes towards prize, prize money for the winners. Um, the, the ponies are bird powder, pursuity pony crosses. And obviously you do get the odd thoroughbred. I mean, we all know thoroughbreds can be gotten off the track. Very easily. And and, you know, I think the whole thing is I would rather be involved and have it monitored. Yes. Records From kept. The the aspect. And, uh, and also you can see the, these guys need access to equipment and tech and shoes and education. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. They actually, we, they, they approached us, which means they are looking for help which is great. And I'd rather assist them than sort of pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah. And wow. these horses are actually for the most in good condition. They are. Yeah. Um, Philippa, um, you cannot do this all alone. Although <laughs> you basically almost do, but you have two remarkable people in your life, um, Michael and Tabiso, who have helped you um, in looking after the welfare of these horses. And this is Michael, and um, they've been with you for, for, for many, 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 um, for many years. Yeah. So Michael um, is our, our group. And you can see just from this photograph, he is the most amazing person to work with. He has been amazing coming out into the communities with me because he just is such a people's person. Yes. He is a horseman as well. He has he has 12 horses on oh their little goodness. family. Yeah. And so Michael loves horses. I mean, he will see our horse. He calls our horses, our sanctuary horses, his babies. Um, sweet. Yeah. Uh, I have an amazing, he, he has an amazing connection with some of our most difficult horses. Um, mm. So I really can't do without Michael. And then the other one Me is Tabiso. Tabiso, I have worked with, he's been with us for longer than Michael. And he was actually, we brought him in. His, his family has a, a fencing business. And when I needed new fencing, safe paddocks for blush, all those years ago when she was going blind, Tabiso was the man that came and did those fences for us. And we realized, wow, this guy is fantastic he's also a horseman he rides um he works in our studio now as well so he is oh, a, a, a we always say we need to clone him <laughs> we need a couple more 
<laughs> we all want one of those um, that is so dedicated yes. and, and committed to the work that, that, that you do. Philippa, um, what are your plans for, for 2021? Um, I know that 95% um, of, your, of your earnings um, go, to, go to this project. And I know for a fact that your monthly donations have only dwindled to 700 Rand a month. Um, and it costs you about 1,200 Rand to look after each horse. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, obviously your struggles of paying vet bills um, and being registered as, a, as an NPO now, you've got to pay um, audited results um yes it's 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 daunting but you've still taken all all of this on but still have um major plans going forward for 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 this year yeah i think as you say karen i've reached a point where i know i cannot do it on my own anymore no. i need to seriously sit down and get some big funders on board send out those proposals Yes. And because, you know, there is just so much that I still need to do. Um, we want to set up, um, I'm calling it horsey spaza shops, you know, like in, in the outlying areas. Uh, Absolutely, so they can go for their tech and their feed and their food and, and whatever it is that they need because 85% of all those animals in the area do not have access to veterinary care or, or any access at all. Yeah. And as you say, it's not just the horses, it's, it's, no. it's all the animals. So we, we're looking at setting up uh, those kind of spaza shop uh, things. We are also wanting to seriously get a lot of the guys trained. Farrier, farriers are few and far between mm. and the guys really struggle. So that's another thing I want to do this year is train a couple of them. And it also creates job opportunities. Yeah, and the harnesses and the carts. Yes. But that is big money. That it is. is big, big money. You know, so we need. But Philippa, to thank go you big. so very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Marika if um, we have any questions in our in our chat in our chat um, section, and um, and if anybody wants to to ask a question. Um, they can put up their hands and like I said, we can unmute you. Um, let us know. Thanks, Marika. Does anyone have a question? We haven't um, at this point, it doesn't look like there's any picture uh, questions, uh, but we've got a lot of praise. Um, <laughs> Stuart Waldy, um, what a wonderful story of Pilot. As with all your amazing horses, Philippa, we're very proud of you. Penny Lancaster, thank you, Philippa. The work you do is just wonderful. And I don't know where these horses would be or the community they live in without you. Um, there is one here from, from Mpo. Um, are there any challenges that Philippa faces when dealing with the older generation and the concept of horse care and welfare? Can I talk? No, yes. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely uh, can. Thanks, Mpul, for that question. Um, you know what? Absolutely, I have never, ever had any issues. The, the owners have always welcomed any kind of support and advice and, um, yeah, I think they, they are just so grateful um, for any, any kind of assistance. And, and in fact, I must say, sometimes um, I have found it, it's sometimes the younger generation that when I have sat with the older cart horse guys, um, you will see they will be sitting around with me and then the young guys go off on the carts and the old guys will curse the, the way the young guys are driving or, you know, so it's quite a, in fact, I think I've even had some of the older guys saying it's like, it's like they think they're driving a car, you know, and off they go. <laughs> Um, so no, the older guys, well, all of them, they are very, they like family. 
then we've got we've got Diana Truter who would like to speak to you. So I'm going to unmute her now. Uh, Diana, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, Philippa. It's Diana Truter from Carters Protection Association. Yes, um, Diana. I would like. I uh, think that we had some form of contact before, but firstly, I would really like to thank you and Michael and to wish you for all the wonderful work um, that you do. Um, and I could see some emotion running through your system as you see the pictures. I unfortunately locked in very late and I, we can relate very close to that. Um, uh, Philippa, something that I just need to throw in here, never forget to look after yourself though when you look after the equines, because if you don't look after yourself, then no one else can look after the horses, just by the way. I've learned that in a very hard, very hard way. Philippa, your relationship with, with the owners, how difficult was that to establish a trust relationship with them? Um, it, it, I think it took about a year. And I'm not talking in terms of they didn't trust us, but it took a year for them to actually actively want to participate and then know that I'm coming in two weeks' time. And they would literally, you would see horses just coming from all, all corners of, of town because they, they meet in the center of town. Um, so it, it took a while for them perhaps to realize I was there for the long haul. Mm. Um, I wasn't going to just come in and say goodbye. And now that you're actually saying that, one of the big things we're looking at doing this year is um, the, the, going into the donkey cart community in the Eastern Cape. Mm. And I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm, I'm also at a point now, I said to, I was chatting to Tabiso and Michael the other day and saying, are you guys ready? Can you speak the language? This is a whole different ball game. You know, so yeah, it, it is challenging, but I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, it's, well, I think once, if you have the trust, you know, and they know that you are there to do good, um, that is why you do have the successes you have. And we would like to thank you very, very much for what you do for those horses. Take care of yourself and regards to Michael and to Bishop. I will. Thank you so much. And thank and you guys for all help over the years and advice you call on us we'll yeah. be there you thank are. you <laughs> no. thanks thanks diana thank um you. great we've got a we've got a question from penny ward you mentioned that the tech and harnesses is a problem what materials are available locally that are good and affordable hmm. yeah this is another thing and and also suddenly right now we've um because you can see in some of the photos, they, the harnesses are in, they're ancient. The guys will use bits of cardboard for blinkers and rope. And so we've, we've really tried to, I must say, people have been good with donating bits, bits in particular. So uh, most of the horses have got fairly good bits now, but now it's, it's the harnesses. And uh, we've, uh, the, the belting, you can buy rolls of belting at a hardware store. Um, so we've been trying to get them to use that. Um, we've also just recently made contact with a, a man in Ireland. And he is sending us, before the end of this month, he, he's come up with an ingenious way of weaving uh that the guys will be able to do at home uh, and weave belting and straps and they won't he's also come up with a way whereby they won't have to use welded rings we can uh use material he's going to show them what materials they can use within their communities to to put harnesses together or repair harnesses but that's all happening now. Sure. Next few months. So that's quite exciting. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Um, um, sorry, Philippa, we're actually running out of, no. out of time. So if anybody sure. has... Um, Karen, we've got 
we've got one more question from okay, Nicola, sure, and then the sorry. question's actually done. So I'm okay. she's going to speak to you. Hold on. Okay, Nicola, you can unmute yourself. Hi, good evening. Hi, Philippa. Hi, everyone. Hi, um, oh, sorry, my earphone is falling out quickly. Um, Philippa, uh, with regards to like, okay, so my little backstory very quickly, I'm actually from Zambia and I used to work with um, King George VI, which was a school for the disabled children in Zimbabwe and there was a um, donkey cart uh, program up in Zambia in Livingston as well that is currently trying to go off the ground, so I understand where you're coming from there and I think um, there is so much potential and so much good that can come out of um, these organizations that work with disabled and children that come from a difficult background what do you think is the um what sort of future is there for for that potential here in south africa do we have to rely more on public funding or what is the um story here in south africa no i'm actually not sure but I, what i what i must say is because we've we're just recently relocated to the eastern cape and i'm uh, i'm not lying my neighbor, a couple of farms down, if you go and look on Facebook, they are, but they do riding with disabled kids. Um, and I've never actually had the chance to sit down and ask them where they get their funding or, so I'm not too sure myself, but if, if you maybe go on to, to my Facebook page, I'll try and remember your name though. Um, and I will uh, I think what they're called is riding with disabled in the Eastern yeah. Cape. Yeah, because I know the, the, the guys in the museum, they got their um, certification through organizations over in America um, in order to work with the kids and to get their NPO um, yep. registration done. And I'd like to one day possibly look at uh, setting up a more, you know, because I really do believe in it. Absolutely, I think it's 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 absolutely amazing what what can happen. Yeah, I will definitely do so. Thank you. Yeah. In touch, and I'll I will I will be in touch. All right. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, there's one one last question um, from Anna Marie. Uh, she just wants to know: Do you see donkeys at all? Up there, I must say it's it's Basuti ponies. Uh, in Lesotho itself, because Tabanchu, the Tabanchu area is is fairly close, about fifty kilometers from Lesotho. There's m many more donkeys in Lesotho, but no, it's 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 Basotho ponies. Yeah. Um, okay, those those are all the questions. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Wow, I can't believe this program has come to <clears throat> to an end. And, um, excuse me, I cannot thank you enough, Philip, for, for, for joining us and for sharing your remarkable story. I'm still in absolute awe on, on, on everything that you do and what you do for these, these horses and actually all animals in need in your area. Um, if anybody wants to, which I'm sure a lot of you looking at the chat room, um, want to know more about what Philippa is doing, please go to www.blindlove co.za and also their Facebook page. Um, Philippa also manages the Facebook page and posts quite regularly um, and to see about the, the incredible work that she does. Thanks so much, Philippa. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, everyone. You're very welcome. Um, please donate to our Coffee with Cartels program. And if you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact me, um, Karin, K-A-R-I-N, at carthorse.org.za. And then please join us again on the 25th of March, where I will be speaking to Marisda Kruger, who heads up the equine division at the animals in distress in the Gauteng area. Thank you for joining. Take care. Keep safe. And, I'll, and, I'll, and until next time, good night.